Hello. Mike, weren't you going to play piano for me? <laughs> Didn't we have a deal? No? OK. I love Mr. Rogers. I didn't when my kids watched him, but I've learned over the years. <laughs> we call him John the Baptist, and in the Bible he was also referred to even by Jesus Christ as John the Baptist, but that's not people called him when they were around him and when they talked to him, they just called him John. When Jesus described him, he was a relative, we don't know how close or how distant, Jesus said, among those who are born of women, there was no one greater than John. Can you get a better compliment from the creator of the world than that? And his story starts back in Isaiah 40. So we'll go to Isaiah 40. And these words, these beautiful words that start off the 40th chapter of Isaiah, um, of course, they came from God to Isaiah, but they're, they're so beautiful that um, a man named Charles Lessons uh, back in... Uh, 400 years ago or so, convinced George Frederick Handel that he should start his work, The Messiah, off with these because it, he felt it was where the story started. And so the, the work, The Messiah, does start off with these words. Isaiah 40, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. And that is where the prophecy of John the Baptist's ministry begins. And uh, many people referred to it. It's referred to a number of times in what we now call the New Testament. If you turn to the book of John, written by a different John, and that, that's an interesting point in itself, is the, the man, the apostle John, who was also a cousin of Jesus, we think, um, he never identified himself in his writings, not in the three letters that we have of his towards the end of the New Testament, and not in this book of John that he wrote. He, uh, he, he refers to himself uh, by different names as the disciple Jesus loved, or the man who was behind Peter, or there's different ways. And uh, there was probably a degree of humility in it, but sometimes I wonder if having lived through uh, the lifetime of John and seeing all the things that John went through and how important he was to the ministry of Jesus Christ, I wonder if John didn't do it as a little bit of an homage to the man that we call John the Baptist, because John does refer to him by name. In the beginning, this is John 1.1, 1, 1, you know it well, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. John wants to start the story as far back as you can go. Through him were all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. And so in five short verses, he's given us the intro. And then there came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. Sent from God. There's no, no gray area there. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, who is the word, Jesus Christ, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. We all know the story of John the Baptist and how he paved the way for Jesus' ministry. We could talk about him for hours. There aren't that many actual verses about John the Baptist, but in those verses, God gives us many clues as to what was going on both in John's life and in his mind, and those are the things that I want to talk about today. I'm going to, um, I'm going to have as a given that you know the story of John the Baptist, that you've read the scriptures, and if not, they're easy enough to find. Um, I've given you the, in, the introduction, but there, it's in all four of the Gospels and even mentioned in the book of Acts. Among other things, I want to try to look at things, at least sometimes, from John's own point of view as much as possible. There's more in the Bible about John's birth than there is about Jesus Christ's birth. And of course, the story of, of John's birth is recorded in Luke 1, and that's where we'll, we'll go now. 
Uh, and Luke himself explains, many have undertaken to draw up an account of things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who, from the first, were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Therefore, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, it seemed good also to me to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of things you have been taught. And the reason I mention that is, this is a story in, in Luke 1 that's well known, but how was it preserved? How do we know what Zechariah said? How do we know what Elizabeth said? How do we know what the angel Gabriel said and what Mary said? Well, Luke tells us that some people took the effort and through the Holy Spirit that they were preserved. It's possible, you know, Zechariah was doing a lot of writing. He couldn't talk. It says he, he wrote words on a tablet. And maybe he wrote down, the th maybe he prepared the things that he said. Maybe they weren't the spontaneous outpouring that we always assume that they are. But let's look at the story a little bit. And we're going to skip through it because, as I said, um, I think you're familiar with the details. It starts off with an elderly couple, a priest named Zechariah, who was uh, uh, descended from the high priest, and his wife Elizabeth also was. They were upright in the sight of God. They observed all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly, but they had no children because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well along in years. And so for many reasons, we often compare this with the story of Abraham and Sarah, who were also along in years. But I think the better parallel would actually be the birth of Samuel, because Samuel, from the time he was born, was also dedicated to God. And it was a situation where his mother couldn't have children, but God intervened. Well, in this case, they definitely couldn't have children. Uh, she was past the age of bearing children. And um, the angel of the Lord, down in 11, appeared to Zechariah. In verse 13, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. A little detail here, he is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth or from his mother's womb, some translations say. So he never, never drank wine or alcohol, and from the beginning, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And this puts him in a small, a very small group of people because there weren't that many. Um, in a way, John, from birth, was the slave of God in that God predicted what he would do. Let's see what it says here. Um, many of the people, verse 16, of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah. And that's important to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Well, as you know, Zechariah doubted, and so he couldn't speak, and um, he came out, and, and he had to make signs, and people thought it was, it was very unusual. When his time of service was completed, down in verse 23, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant, and for five months, remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace from, from the people, which is pretty much what was said at the time that Samuel was also conceived. Um, it's interesting to me that, that Gabriel says, God has heard your prayers and given you a child. Well, those prayers were probably decades old when you think about it, because suppose they were, say, around age 70. It says they were elderly, and, and uh, 70 doesn't strike me as elderly, but let's just say that. Uh, that. That means that Elizabeth had not been able to give birth for decades at that point. And I suspect that the prayers stopped around then, you know, that they thought, oh, well, you know, we'll have a different kind of life that we've prayed for children, but now it's impossible. So it's just a little lesson there that, that sometimes old, old, old prayers are kept in the memory of God. And sometimes, you know, he said he answered this prayer, but the prayer was probably many decades old at that point. And of course, um, Mary, was visited by Gabriel. We read that starting in verse 26. And she said, uh, behold, the handmaid of the Lord, let it be as you said. But there's, a, there's an, an interesting verse here in verse 37 that also applies not just to Jesus' birth, but to John's also. In, in verse 37, 
Well, let's start in 36. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. And that verse, for nothing is impossible with God, I'm reading it out of the New International Version, but I don't know if you're aware of this. There's more than one version of the New International Version. They update it from time to time. And um, when this is... uh, Let's see, I have it written down here. In, in another version of the New International Version, this is translated, no word from God will ever fail. No word from God will ever fail. And if you apply that to John the Baptist, the angel has already said what is going to happen. And John had to make it happen. He didn't really, well, he had a choice. He could, he could either go along with what he was supposed to do or not. And we know that he chose to go along with it. But it's interesting to me that, that the, uh, I hate to say the word die is cast, but the, the events were set in motion by that. Because what God has said would happen would not, would not fail. It had, to, it had to be. And so um, Mary visits Elizabeth. Mary sings a beautiful song. But then in verse 37, 57, John is born. She gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. And bear in mind, everybody knew about this, that there was this, let's say, 80, let's say 85-year-old woman giving birth to a baby. Well, there was no um, Facebook at the time, but somehow human beings got the word around that there was this woman who was going to give birth and her husband worked in the temple. And uh, you know, you all know Elizabeth and, and Zechariah and she was pregnant. So this was a big news event. On um, her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah, but his mother said, no, he's going to be called John. And they said, no, that's not your family tradition. And the the father signed, he asked for a writing tablet and said, no, his name is is John. That's what it has to be, that, that God had actually predicted that. Immediately his mouth was opened, his tongue was loosed, and he began to speak praising God. Verse 65, the neighbors were all filled with awe and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about these things. So this was not a private event. This was big, strange, wonderful news. This was BuzzFeed material. This wasn't CNN. This was stuff that people were really, really, this was People Magazine. They were really interested in this stuff. And everybody who heard about this wondered about it and asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. And we know that John was at least eight days old at that point. I mean, that's, that's when the ceremony took place. And um, so, so the next part, Zechariah's song, was not necessarily right when John was born. It wasn't, it was, well, it couldn't have been, could it? Because he couldn't talk when his son John was born. So it had to certainly be after that eighth day. And because of all that happened, you know, and people talking and the Lord's hand was with him, Zechariah might have said this later. Zechariah might have taken time to compose this. Or it could have been spontaneous. Somehow, John learned about these words. He would have read them later on. Luke researched them and found them somehow, so they were preserved. Verse 67, his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and redeemed his people. And then he talks about all the wonderful things. And by verse 75, you realize that he hasn't mentioned his son at all, that this is a happy man, but he's talking about Mary's son. And then in verse 76, undertones of Prince Harry here, people. In verse 76, and you, my child, oh, right, I have a son too. And you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, which by the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. So that's what he says about his own son. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the desert until he appeared publicly to Israel. And that's quite a summing up, because when you think about probably what happened was, John was, uh, we we had an elderly couple in the Montana church, um, They're both deceased, I could say their names, Art Thomas and Ruby Thomas. Ruby Thomas was um, 
<laughs> she was still alive when we went back to uh, Montana the first time for the feast in 2010. I was hoping that nobody who actually knew me would be there. Uh, but she looked at me and she said, you've put away a few groceries since the last time I saw you. <laughs> and uh, I thought, okay. Um, but Ruby Thomas had a, had a son. He is alive. Um, he was alive last night. It was possible he would be listening to this. He'd probably be Oh, he'd probably be almost 50 by now. And, uh, you know, the little kid, he was raised by old people. And it was just a little different. I don't want to say that uh, he turned out pretty normal. <laughs> Bryce, if you're listening, you turned out normal. <laughs> You'll be glad to know. But, you know, it's different. You, you've seen it. When older people raise a single kid, and he never, of course, would have had a brother or sister. It was miraculous enough that he was there. And probably his parents were gone fairly soon. We don't know how, how long they lived, but it's possible that, that he grew up without them. And why out in the wilderness? Why out in the wilderness? Well, um... You know, he was a topic of news at this point, and the nation of Israel was watching him grow up. And he grew up, and as we know, he ate wild locusts. He, he ate locusts and wild honey. He was dressed in garments made out of camel's hair, and I've heard the case put forth, well, you know, camel's hair is nice clothing, and it is. It can, camel's hair coats are wonderful, but Jesus put that to rest. He said, no, people who wear beautiful garments live in palaces, and that's not what you went out to see. So, so Jesus pretty much confirms the idea that, that John paid very little attention to clothing and paid very little attention to food. And I think maybe one of the reasons that he ate locusts, and some people say, well, it was carob pods, but that only works in English. That doesn't work in Greek and Aramaic. Locusts are locusts. He ate grasshoppers. How many of you have eaten a grasshopper? I've eaten, yay, a, a surprising number of people. Um, it's not seasoned, but maybe we could work them in in the summertime this, this coming year. Um, I saw the hands that went up. We'll talk. Um, with butter, they're not bad. They taste like butter when you do them in butter. Um, we, we sometimes had them on campouts out in, uh, in Montana. And as you know, they're one of the few icky things that's actually considered clean for us to eat. And I, I get the feeling that John just didn't care that much about food, that he ate what was, it doesn't say he never ate anything besides locusts and wild honey, but that's pretty much what he lived on. He foraged. Did he have any guidance at all? Well, it seems like he might have been in touch with a group called the Essenes. Uh, they're well known historically, you can look them up. It, we have no uh, hard evidence that he was, but the Essenes baptized, among other things. One difference was they, they purified themselves every day. But the Essenes were a baptizing culture and they were a, um, they were a uh, ascetic, A-S-C-E-T-I-C -E culture. They gave up things. They fasted. They, they didn't believe in partying. They, they um, believed in, in a very simple life. And it's possible that he was guided by them. We don't know what happened here, but he grew up in the shadow of knowing that he was not the bridegroom. That he was not the bridegroom. He was the friend of the bridegroom. He was on earth to point towards someone who was coming, but he was not that person, that he was always second chair, that, that that's the way that he would be. And he, he also grew up knowing that his father, when he did this address, talked about Jesus first, and then he talked about how wonderful John would be. And you know, they might have, he might have lived long enough that they actually had a relationship, but it was a, an odd childhood, and it, it was different from Jesus's. Jesus's birth was full of very strange things that were recorded, but people by and large forgot about them. One reason we know that was when people were arguing, well, is he the Messiah? The, the uh, uh, priests said, uh, he can't be the Messiah because the Messiah was born in Bethlehem and this man is from Galilee. That's the story that they had. And so they ruled him out for that reason. And so they just didn't know the details of his birth. You know, um, you know if they had known that he was, uh, he was indirectly responsible for the slaughtering of little children, you know, that if it hadn't been for him, that wouldn't have happened. It could have cast a pall on things. But after he was born, after they moved back to Nazareth, the point of Jesus' life was to be normal, was to be, have as normal a childhood as he could. And we get the feeling, you know, he was in the temple at age 12 asking questions. We get the feeling that he was figuring things out, that God left him to do that. And not until he was actually baptized by John and the Spirit descended did he have full understanding and memory. 
Um, difficult to prove we can talk about it in the world tomorrow? No, we can listen to people tell us about it in the world tomorrow and get the exact truth on that, but it, it's quite a contrast. Jesus grew up eating and drinking. He was clothed fairly well. Um, the, the soldiers argued over his clothing. John didn't, and that becomes a sore point later on. So we don't know what all takes place in this verse in verse 80, but it's a very important verse. Somehow John was given information directly from God. He got his information from God, and this in itself is a, is a little problematical. He was a prophet, but the way the prophets got their words in the Old Testament was the Lord would speak to them and say, the prophets would say, thus says the Lord, and they could uh, give the words. Well, the Lord was in a womb at this moment, and then grew up as a boy in Nazareth at this point. So the Lord wasn't delivering messages at this point. So somehow John did get the information. He got it from God the Father, but probably through Gabriel, or it seems like they'd worked out some communication system because John seems to receive words from God that other people can't hear, and uh, he understands them. So it was possible it was a mind thing, but, but there aren't that many people like that in the Old Testament, and those that are are called prophets, and that's why it would be accurate to call John a prophet. He was in the communications loop, maybe even more than Jesus. And that may seem a little weird, but John was told what to do. Where did he learn that he had to baptize? Where did he learn that he had a ministry of repentance? Where did he learn that he was looking for a particular person whose, whose shoes he wasn't even worthy to tie? He was given concrete, detailed information. We don't get that. We have to make choices based on what we see, based on what's taught to us, based on what we read in God's word. But a lot of God's word didn't exist at that point, and, and somehow John had a direct feed. Um, this was one reason that he, he said to have come in the spirit of Elijah, was that Elijah also seemed to have that direct feed. And, you know, John was a human being. He would have had choices, but his basic choices were, should I do what God wants me to do and fulfill the entire plan of God, or should I not? And it seems that he continually chose to do what God asked him to do. In this way, he was more of a slave to God, and I don't, I don't mean that in the, the worst possible context. We're all supposed to be slaves to Jesus, but he really was in that we have a choice of what we eat for breakfast. John, oh good, locusts and wild honey, okay, that's what we'll have today. Um, let's see, what will I wear today? Hmm, my one garment, okay. Uh, and, and so um, he... He learned things, and one of the things that he learned that was very important that it appears that Jesus didn't know was that he knew when to begin his ministry. There's no indication of how he knew that, but it was a sign to Jesus that his own ministry would, would be beginning. And don't think Jesus wasn't aware of John the Baptist growing up in the wilderness at this point. News was news, and uh, Jesus probably heard about it and probably put it together in the picture that he was forming about his own father at that point. You re will remember that at the wedding at Cana, when it came time to turn water into wine, that Mary was the one pushing, that Jesus was saying, he literally said, Mom, my time hasn't come. And she just said, do whatever he tells you to do, and, <laughs> you know, and he did it. And um, it was soon after that, of course, that, that everything started happening. But he, among other things, John was a signal for Jesus to actually begin. As I said, he was second to Jesus from birth, and he knew that. He always looked at Jesus, and I mean this in the best possible way, as the greater. If he was publishing his memoirs today to get back at Jesus, he would call it Never the Bridegroom. Um, you know, there's a, a memoir out this week that's, that's, that's sort of along those lines. Did he know Jesus? Well, that's an interesting question. When we turn to John 3 which is where uh, the Gospel of John actually starts talking about the, the specific things that John did. When we turn to John 3, we find that he says twice, John 3, chapter, or verse 31, John 3, verse 31, he says, I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. He knew that that was his job. And uh, again, he's, he says one more time, if you read the rest of the story, he says, I, I didn't know him, 
Um, in, in verse 33, he says, I would not have known him except the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is he who will baptize until the Holy Spirit. So John talked about Jesus before Jesus showed up, possibly as just a, an unknown but necessary figure. But then when, when he actually saw Jesus, he realized who he was. And he knew who Jesus was before he baptized him. And the reason we know this is that in Matthew... He says to Jesus, I shouldn't be baptizing you. You should be baptizing me. And he was correct. But Jesus said, well, that's not the way we're going to do it. There's a reason to do it this way. And John did baptize Jesus. But it means that before the Holy Spirit descended, John had already either been told or figured out, possibly as Jesus walked toward him, he got that message in the earpiece. And he, he knew that. And as I said, that, that made him, he was a strange person. Um, he, was, he operated differently from, from the rest of people. His message fit with Jesus' message, but it wasn't exactly Jesus' style. And you know the things that he said. Let's turn to Matthew. Matthew ver, chapter 3. And it tells us what he said. In Matthew 3, starting in verse 7, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said, you brood of snakes. That's the first thing we know that he said to anybody. What a way to start out your ministry. I like to think maybe he had an introduction uh, before then. But um, he said, you brood of snakes who warned you to flee from the coming wrath, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And that's very John. John was a message about people needing to change. And, and you know, Jesus tells us we need to change, but he gives us time. John says, no, now. The flames are coming, the axe is coming, change. And he had a point. I mean, Jesus was going to show up, and, and John wanted people to be prepared. Uh, it says, you know, in, in Luke 1, that he would turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. And we don't get a lot of that in the words we know about John. I mean, you can read the rest of what he said. He talked to, to in the book of John, he, he talked to soldiers and said, don't harass people. And he talked to tax collectors and said, only collect what you're supposed to. Um, things that they were supposed to have been doing anyway, but, but John um, held them to it. And he said, you need to change. You need to clean up your lives. And he knew that he was doing it to prepare for something greater. Matthew 3 and verse 2 sums up his ministry. And I'll just read it out. I'll just jump in. Matthew 3 verse 2. And saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And boy was it near. When Jesus says the kingdom of God is at hand, you can interpret that various ways. But in John, it was literal. Kingdom of heaven was near. I mean, geographic, he was on the maps app at that point. He was approaching. He was there. And so John meant it quite literally at that point. And also, he wanted immediate action, and he wanted, uh, he told them that judgment was at hand. Now, in Luke 3, and verse 18, we read something that isn't mentioned anywhere else. Luke 3... And verse 18. And again, we'll just take this out of context. And with many other words, Luke 3, 18. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and preached the good news to them. So what I'm guessing is that there was a lot that John said that we don't have. Because what he was just talking about was, um, you know, people... <laughs> his winnowing fork is in his hand and at the threshing floor and he'll burn up the chaff, etc., etc. It doesn't sound like good news, but John did preach the good news. He preached the gospel, same wording. He, he preached what Jesus preached. So God had probably told him his plan, and I like to think that God had shown him a vision of the city afar off, you know, that's mentioned in Hebrews 11, that all the men and women of God had looked at over the years, even though John would not see it. Um, one of the most compelling things about John's message that we know is not the message itself, but that people came out to the wilderness to see him, that people put aside their lives and went through difficulty to come out to John. Jesus went to people. People came to John. He didn't move for them. He expected them to come to him. And what was it about John's message that called him? I, I assure you, it was not saying you're all going to burn up in the fire. <laughs> 
There was something compelling that they knew that he had messages from God and that they needed to change. And he did talk quite a bit before Jesus' baptism. He talked about a person who's coming and he made it imminent. He made people realize, I'm not talking about a Messiah coming in 2,000 years. I'm talking about a man who is in your midst and will come and I will know him when that happens. He didn't do any miracles. And so it must have been a very compelling message that drew people out. It wasn't so that they could be healed. It certainly wasn't so that they could be fed. He didn't claim to be Elijah. In, in the book of John, in chapter 1, talking about at the beginning of his ministry, book of John and chapter 1, starting in verse 19, now this was John's testimony when the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I'm not the Christ. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? No. Then who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. Who do you, what do you say about yourself? And he went to those words of Isaiah that we just read, I am the voice of one calling in the desert, make straight the way for the Lord, which is what his father had also said, and the angel Gabriel. Jesus, of course, identified him as Elijah. John only knew what he had been given. He did not know for sure that he was Elijah or he wouldn't have denied it. John was imprisoned early in Jesus' ministry. If you turn to Matthew 4 and verse 12, it seems to indicate, if we're reading it correctly, Matthew 4 and verse 12, Jesus has just come back from the temptation in the wilderness with, with the devil. And in verse 12, it says, when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he returned to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali. And, and what this means is he knew that the time had come. There was no getting around it at this point. He had already been baptized, and um, he'd already uh, lived through the temptation, and he'd already received the spirit in the form of a dove without measure at this point, and he already remembered his father and was back in touch with him after 30 years of, of only being marginally in touch. And Jesus began to preach in verse 17, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Have you heard that before? John was the bridge. John was the bridge between the prophets of old and the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was instructed by God, but he was still only human when he was in prison. Of course, it was King Herod who imprisoned him, and he imprisoned him because John went too far for Herod. He said, the, the, you're living in adultery with the woman that you're currently married with. An interesting thing to think about today when, again, there's a human being who right now is saying that the present king and queen of a well-known country uh, you know, began the relationship by breaking the seventh commandment. I mean, nowadays people can get away with it and you can become king and queen at that point. But Herod had have, had, had enough and he, he grabbed him and he put, it in, put him in prison. And it says in, in the book of Mark, and you can read the account there, some very curious things. Herod didn't like John and he was puzzled by John. That's the exact word, he was puzzled, but he liked to listen to him. And his wife was always saying, put him to death, put him to death. And one of the reasons that, that he lived as long as he did, because he seemed to live at least a couple years in captivity, and he seemed to have access to his disciples. It seemed like they could come and talk to him or at least receive messages from him was because Herod was touched by him. And it was John the Baptist who, who made Herod curious about Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, Herod thought that Jesus Christ was John the Baptist brought back to life after he'd killed him. It haunted him. And it's one of the reasons that he really wanted to see Jesus before his crucifixion, and he did. There was a lot going on there. Um, there may have been some resentment between John's disciples and Jesus' disciples. We read in a few places, but let's read it specifically in Matthew 9 and verse 14. No, Matthew, yeah, Matthew 9, starting in verse 14. John is in prison at this point, but he sent two disciples. We know this from one of the other books. I can't remember. Um, Jesus is doing all his miracles. He's feeding people. He's about to send out the 12 with, with their own ministry. And in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 14, then John's disciples came and asked him, how is it that we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Well, he gave a beautiful answer. He said, how can the guests of the bridegroom 
bridegroom was the term that their leader, John, had applied to him. He was using John's own words to answer. How can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and then they will fast, and indeed they did. Um, and, And Jesus had more to say about John. But soon after this, Soon after this, um, in Luke 7, in verse 18. Hmm, am I in the right place? No, I'm in the wrong book. Luke 7, in verse 18. um, John's disciples came to him with another message. And this was John, John the human being, John in prison, John who didn't have a lot to do, John who had dedicated his entire life to God and had been rewarded by being thrown into prison. He probably wasn't eating uh, locusts and wild honey at that point. He probably had to eat even worse things at that point. Verse 18 of Luke 7, John's disciples told him about all these things. Calling two of them, he sent them to the Lord to ask, are you the one who was to come or should we expect someone else? And the reason for this was John, again, had only the information that God had given him. And God had told him that Jesus would come and and have a ministry of repentance. But from John's teachings, we know that he also knew that the Christ would winnow, that the Christ would come back and establish his kingdom. And John wasn't seeing that. The things that he saw Jesus do didn't match up with the words that he had given his life for, basically, at this point. And John had questions. Are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. Impossible things, impossible things. So he replied to the messengers, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, and that just couldn't happen without God's intervention. The deaf hear, the dead are raised, the good news is preached to the poor. And then he probably said with a a tone of sympathy in his voice, he said, blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. In other words, hang in there, John. You're on the program at this point. It may not seem like it to you, but you are. After John's messengers left, and it's a pity they didn't go back with this, but Jesus, he was still thinking about it. He began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out to the desert to see? And they had gone out. These were people, everyone knew who John was. Did you go out to see a reed swayed in the wind? Did you go out to see the grass blow across the lake? The beautiful wilderness? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury are in palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet. Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is the one about whom it is written. And this is from Malachi. I will send my messenger ahead of you, and who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. All the people, even the tax collectors... (laughs) I love that phrase. All the people, even the tax collectors, you know. When they heard Jesus' words, tax collectors must have felt good when they read this. Even the tax collectors acknowledged that God's way was right because they had been baptized by John. But the Pharisees and experts in the law rejected God's purpose for themselves because they had not been baptized by John. He called them snakes because of that. Well, John died. John died very quickly. There was a party. John had no idea when he woke up that morning that he was going to die. All he knew was that something happened in the other room. Soldiers came in, and that was the last he knew. That was how John's vision of his own life ended. He thought he was meant for certain things, but suddenly it ended, and he was young. He was around 30. One of the reasons Mr. Thomas doesn't waste a lot of time on young adult announcements is we don't have many young adults uh, he would have been older than Kendall and Alan, but he would have been younger probably than, than anybody else in the room. He was a young man when he was whisked off. And as I said, he woke up one morning thinking it was going to be a normal day in prison, and then he was gone. And it was over. He didn't have time to think of a legacy or anything like that. But his, his, his ministry stayed with Jesus. What did Jesus think of John? Luke 16 and verse 16. He knew that he couldn't have done his own work without John. 
The law and the prophets were, were proclaimed till John. John was a dividing line. Since that time, the good news of the kingdom of God is being preached and everyone is forcing his way into it. John had started this with his very forceful, some say violent message, which is a word that's used here sometimes. It is easier for heaven and earth to disappear than for the least stroke of a pen to drop out of the law. So Jesus is saying the law is still there. But John was the bridge. John was the one who started this new thing. When he received the news of the death, uh, in, in one place we read about this is in Matthew 14. I'm not very good at split sermons yet, so please give me a few more minutes. <laughs> I'll get better. Honest. If he'd left out that piano playing, I would have had a lot more time. Um, Matthew 14, but it was really nice piano playing. Matthew 14, verse 15. Uh, the first 12 verses are about um, John the Baptist being beheaded. In verse 13, when Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. But people wouldn't let him have time alone. He wanted some time to think at that point, but they wouldn't let him. That was probably good for him. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. And you read what happens in the verses afterwards, and he really didn't have time to even take a breath at this point, that he, he realized that he, was, he too was on earth to obey the word of God and the directions of God, and so he kept going. Um, people thought he was the John the Baptist. They did after he died. Remember, he says, who do people say that I am to his apostles? And they said, well, some people say you're John the Baptist. And some people say you're Elijah. Some people say you're the prophet who was to come. And he said, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you're the Christ the son of God. And uh, from that point on, his ministry was different. He, after John had died, he started talking about his own death. There's a poignant passage in John chapter 10 and verse 40. Um, and this is towards the end. This is right before Jesus goes and raises Lazarus, very near the time when he was arrested. In John 10 and verse 40, then Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. And don't think he didn't stand there and think about the beginning of his own ministry, being baptized there. And he could see John, and he could see John's disciples. You know, he'd, he spent time every day with John's disciples. Some of them became his own disciples. We know Andrew for sure. Was, was John the Baptist's disciple, and John had to deal with this, uh, that, that people would leave him and go to Jesus. But it then, he says, here he stayed, and many people came to him. It wasn't a convenient place, by the way. They said, though John never performed a miraculous sign, all that John said about this man was true, and in that place, many believed in Jesus. So just by going there, he helped people change their mind and repent and become part of, of eventually God's family just by being where, where John had done that. John meant, Jesus mentions him, one of the last things he says on earth in Acts 1, he mentions John. Acts 1, he's about to leave his disciples, and in, in um, John, or Acts 1, the book of Acts, chapter 1 and verse 4, he says, on one occasion while he was eating with them, this is right before he was taken up into heaven, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised for which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So he said, everything that John said, you know, it's still a progression here. It's going to happen. Um, they did leave Jerusalem, but they'd <laughs> he had told them. Um, later on in the book of Acts, remember Apollos? Apollos, quite a person in the book of Acts. He helped many come to Jesus at that point. Apollos had been taught the, John. He knew about Jesus Christ and he taught accurately, but he only knew about the baptism of John. And uh, he had to be brought up to speed at that point. And Paul in Acts 19, also in Ephesus, I believe, also finds disciples of John who had been baptized with water, but he baptized them with the Holy Spirit at that point. Well, to sum it up, to sum up John's life, he was probably an orphan from an early age, probably grew up in the wilderness under severe restrictions. He learned from God himself. He had no siblings or family, never knew a wife. He did have his disciples, and we'd like, I'd like to think that they were friends and supporters. His message was so gripping that people left their comforts and came out to him to be harangued, to be told that they, were, <laughs> they needed to change, that their lives were deficient at that point. God must have told him about the rewards. Turn to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, the faith chapter. 
and we'll start in verse 13. All these people, and it's a list of all the people who'd served God up to this point. John, John was already dead at this point. He would have been in that list. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. And down at the, at the end of verse 16, it says, Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. And John must have had that vision, or he couldn't have done what he did. And yet from a, from a human standpoint, we can understand his moments of discouragement and the beginnings of doubt, and he did have choices. John chose the right thing. And that's, why, that's why Jesus could say, Nobody better born of woman has ever lived. He gave his all, he obeyed every direction, and he was imprisoned and killed. And if that were the end of the story, from John's standpoint, he would have had a kind of a sad life. Not much fun, by the way most of us define it. His life was all work and all giving up things and all sacrifice. Thankfully, there's more. I'm looking forward to meet John, meeting John in the kingdom because... John's life will go on. And, you know, when Jesus gave us that hint and said, but even the least in the kingdom is greater than John, he was dropping a giant hint that John's life would go on in the kingdom. I, I've said, I can't even tell if I'm joking when I say this, but I have said that one of the things I would like to do in the world tomorrow, soon after Jesus Christ returns to earth, and it can, whatever fits into his schedule, I'm flexible at that point, um, is I want to buy Jesus a cup of coffee because he's never had one. And I want Jesus to know what a cup of coffee, he invented coffee, he just, the doofuses he made never quite figured out what you were supposed to do with coffee. Can you imagine how coffee would have changed his ministry? He wouldn't have had to sleep in boats. Uh, he, he could have done all kinds of things. Well, I want to buy Jesus a cup of coffee. I want to buy John a good meal. I'm going to take them to a good restaurant. I'll have to stand in line because there'll be all kinds of people who want to talk to John. And of course, he'll already have been at the wedding banquet at that point, so he'll be no stranger to good things. But can you imagine? He's never had a glass of wine. They bring him wine, and he knows what it is. He knows what wine is. But that first taste, his life in the kingdom will be different. He will be praised. He will have friends. He will be beloved. We will take classes from him. We will sit and listen to his every word. We'll hear about how he grew up in the wilderness. We'll hear about his life. We'll hear about his, his um, outlook on things. I'd like to hear from him all these things and how, how he saw it. Among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist, yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. But he'll be one of those. It sounds like a slam when Jesus said it the first time, but it's the best thing he could say. In Hebrews 12 and verses 1 to 3, we read about John. I mean, this talks about all, all God's people, but Hebrews 12, verses 1 to 3, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And that's what John did. He didn't drink. He didn't party. Jesus did and was criticized for it. John didn't and was criticized for it. But John threw all those weights away. He ran his race very unencumbered. Um, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, which he did, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And John knew that that was part of the plan. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so you will not grow weary and lose heart. John will be in the kingdom of heaven. He and Jesus can talk as relatives, as friends, and as fellow servants. And I want to be there to hear all of that, and I'd like to see you there too.